Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at a new paper from DeepMind. Even though this paper was kind of stealthily released over the last week, it has some very interesting implications for training large language models and also gives a new state-of-the-art model that outperforms models like GPT-3 and Gopher. That model is called Chinchilla. Chinchilla, however, I think is not even the best part of this paper. One of the things that I really love about this is that they train over 400 language models, each ranging from 70 million to 16 billion parameters. That is a lot of models for running a lot of tests. And as you'll see in this paper later, when we get down to the experiments, the result is being able to understand very well how to properly scale these models in the most efficient way possible. And with those results, they're able to throw shade at all these models that have massive numbers of parameters and do really well because they release a model with only 70 billion parameters. I mean, 70 billion, that's still a lot, but much less than Gopher at 280 billion or GPT-3 at 175 billion. Yet, Chinchilla still outperforms all of these models. Perhaps the craziest thing is that they don't even use any sort of new architecture or any sort of new training regime, almost all of it is the same as past works. So the question obviously arises, how do they make a model that performs a lot better while still using significantly less parameters? And that is what we're going to be talking about in this paper today. I should say the full title of this paper is Training Compute Optimal Large Language Models. And that is what this paper is all about. It's about being computationally efficient with these models, which might sound boring at first, but when you take these concepts and you apply them to such a large scale, when you're working with hundreds of billions of parameters, well, we can get results like reducing a 280 billion parameter model to a model that's closer to 70 billion parameters and still getting better results. So with that, hopefully I've piqued your interest a little bit regarding this paper. The one last thing I want to say before we dive into this paper is if you do like this type of content, I do a whole lot of it on my channel. So do consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps out and it means a lot to me. If we scroll down to the beginning of the introduction here, one thing I want to focus on is this Kaplan et al paper because they will be mentioning this many times throughout this paper. What they talk about is how this paper essentially showed a power law relationship between the number of parameters in an autoaggressive language model and its performance. Okay, so th that's a lot. Essentially, all that means is that when you take a model and you increase the number of parameters by an order of magnitude, you end up getting linearly scaling performance. So it says if I add an extra tenfold parameters to my model, I get some performance increase. And then if I add an extra tenfold parameters, I get that same performance increase or, or something roughly around those lines. I'm not sure if it's necessarily a tenfold, but you get that sort of scaling. And as they correctly point out here right after this, these sorts of results have been leading to larger and larger models. So, you know, the trend recently has just been you scale up your model, you train for a long time, and you get <laughs> better results. One interesting thing they actually point out is that lots of times you actually don't want to even train these models to completion. Uh, and they say that right here, they should not be trained to the lowest possible loss to be compute optimal. And this idea of compute optimality is very important. The idea is essentially, how do we get the best bang for our buck, right? If we have a limited computation budget, which you know, you're know you often going to be limited by computation when you're training these large models, well, you want to figure out beforehand, well, how big should the model be so that we can get the optimal performance out of it? And in this paper, they say that they reach the same conclusion. They find that, yes, you don't want to train these models to completion. However, they do find one large difference with that Kaplan et al. paper. And what that difference is, is that once you get a 10 times increase in compute budget, what they say in that paper is that you should have a 5.5 times increase in the size of the model or the number of parameters. However, you only increase the training token. So the training tokens is like the number of tokens that uh, the model is trained on. That should only increase by 1.8 times. However, this paper finds that that is not correct. Instead of increasing the number of tokens by 1.8 times, so it scales up significantly slower than the size of the model, it should actually be scaled up proportionally to the size of the model. So if we have a model going from 1 billion parameters to 10 billion parameters, and this model was trained on 5 million tokens, that's that's way too few, but just to give an example, well then now, because we are multiplying this by 10, we should also multiply the number of tokens by roughly 10. That's what this paper is saying. They're saying that these past models like GPT-3, they have been vastly scaling the number of parameters, but they've been keeping the number of tokens they're training on a constant. And they point out that this is quite a big issue. And in this paper, as you'll see, when we actually scale up the amount of training data and do something that's so simple as that, right? All they're doing is scaling up the amount of training data. We can actually get much better results for the same amount of compute power. Now, if we scroll down to the first figure in this paper right here, what you'll see is right here, we have Chinchilla on the bottom. And then above that, we have a group of three models. And what you'll see is that, first of all, these top three models are some of the previous models that were doing very well. So Gopher, GPT-3, Megatron, Turing, and LG. And then the bottom one right here in the teal color is Chinchilla. So on the x-axis, we have flops. Now, if you don't know what flops are, they're essentially a measure of computation, maybe not a perfect measure, 
but nevertheless a measure of computation that stands for floating point operations per second, or just floating point operations in general. And on the x-axis, we have the number of parameters. So what is this graph showing? This is sort of a sneak peek of what we'll be looking at very soon. It shows that, remember, Chinchilla performs better than all these models. However, you can see it actually has less, per oh, that's not a very straight line, but you can see it actually has a smaller number of parameters. However, it's still trained with the same amount of compute as all of these models. And, and this is kind of the key of this paper. It's saying you don't need to scale your models up so big, your models are under-trained. You can still do just as well with a smaller model because you're not training enough to make use of this massive amount of parameters you're using. Now, if that's a little bit confusing right now, don't worry about it. We will be going over these ideas in much more depth in the upcoming sections of this paper. And now if we scroll down to this table down here, we can see something similar except for with the number of parameters and the number of training tokens. As you already saw, Chinchilla has many less parameters than these other models, but it has many more training tokens. And I guess this was kind of what I was going for or kind of what I was saying before. You see it has 1.4 trillion whereas these other models only have 300 billion. And this is the secret to its success. This is kind of what I was already saying in the intro though. So let's get this out of the way and get a bit more deeper into this. Down here is where the method section of this paper really starts. And in this method section, they essentially talk about given some sort of compute limitation, how they can go about figuring out how big a model should be and how many training tokens they should be using. And that's essentially what they write right here, right? Given a fixed flops budget, how should one trade off model size and the number of training tokens? And as it turns out, this is actually not such an easy question to answer. And the reason it's not an easy question to answer is because they have three parameters here, right? They have the number of flops, they have the amount of params, and then they also have the number of tokens. And this is essentially an optimization problem. Normally, if you're given the number of flops, well, then you can do some sort of search over these two, right? You can search, you can say, well, if we use this number of params, how about all these numbers of tokens? How do these work? Or if we have this number of tokens, what about this set of parameters? You can essentially just try a bunch of different things. The issue here, is that every time they want to try a different combination of the number of parameters and the number of tokens, they have to train a model and that model will have hundreds of millions or billions of parameters. So it's very expensive to sample each of these points. And that's why they end up having, and that's why they end up having to train around 400 separate models. In order to optimize this objective, well, they try three different approaches. So we are going to start with the first, and this is where things get a little bit interesting. So the first approach is fairly simple. What they say is we vary the number of training steps for a fixed family of models. So essentially that means they are given some sort of parameters. I mean, they're not given it, but they decide some parameter number, right? So say 400 million parameters. And then what they do is they take that number of parameters and they train four different models using different training sequences. So what do they mean by training sequences here? They don't, I don't think they actually ever define this term, but it seems like what they mean is just a different number of tokens. So maybe one of these models will be trained with 500 million tokens. Another one will be trained with uh, 1 trillion tokens, another one with 200 billion tokens, and you get the idea. And hopefully that gives you an idea. What they do from there is then they are able to, what they say is directly extract an estimate of the minimum loss achieved for a given number of training flops. So what that means, and I should probably draw this out, right? So they start with a bunch of different numbers, say 70 million, and you have 200 million, and then you have maybe 500 million, and all of these are different numbers of parameters. For each of these, they will now train four different models, and each of these models uses a different number of tokens to train on. So two, like 1 billion, 5 billion, and so on. So once they have this, not only will they have these trained models, but they'll also know how much compute was used to train each of these models because, well, they've trained them. They have that number at this point, right? So they can now sort of go in reverse and they can say, so maybe this one took, and sorry, I'm running out of room here. So let me do it down here. So this was like 1 billion tokens, which took maybe like 1 e to the 23 flops or something. What they can do now is they can go through all these models that they've trained, which is going to be a lot of models, and they can find all the ones that took this many flops to train or roughly this many flops. So 10 to the 23 flops. And from all those models, they can take the one that had the lowest loss. So the one that performed the best, and then they can say, and then they can plot that point and say, for this amount of flops, this is the combination of model size and number of training tokens that works the best. So when they do that, we get graphs like what we will see up here. 
So the first thing you'll see on the left is the computation power versus the training loss. I, I actually, this graph is very beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just a normal graph, but I sometimes, you know, the colors are nice and very lovely. And essentially what you can see is for the darker colors on the left right here, these are smaller models and the larger models have these brighter colors on the right. And what you'll see in gray, well, these are the final training losses. And what you see is that if you take the best models for each number of flops, that looks somewhat asymptotic, like it might go something like this if you were to extend. I'm not entirely sure, but you can see that there's clearly a pattern here. Then if you take these same runs that are the best for each number of flops and you plot them against the parameters and the tokens, what we see is that we get these linear relationships. So here we have this linear fit and here we have this linear fit. And if this pattern keeps continuing, well, as you might guess, we will be able to predict for a given number of flops how many parameters we should use and how many tokens we should use, which is quite cool. You can see that the pattern is pretty strong, although there is a very interesting thing happening here, and I'm not entirely sure why this is, but you'll see that there's sort of these diagonal patterns within these graphs. And even here for the training number of tokens, you see these diagonal patterns. I'm actually not entirely sure what these are. I was thinking about it for a bit and I didn't really come to an answer. If you think you know what these are, then please let me know in the comments below. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this uh, because it's not something they mentioned in the paper, even though it is a very clear pattern. That's really all there is to this first method of estimating the number of parameters and tokens. So now let's move on to the second method they use. These are the graphs for the second method. And in the first method, what they did is they started with the number of parameters, and then from there, they varied the amount of tokens. However, here what they're doing is they're starting with some amount of flops. So they're starting with a compute budget, and now they vary the amount of parameters. Now, clearly the tokens are being left out here, but remember the combination of the size of the model plus how many tokens you're training on actually decides the number of flops you'll end up using. So once we decided the number of parameters and we know how many flops we have, well, from there, we can then calculate how many tokens we should be training on to meet that compute budget. So these are essentially two different ways of trying to figure out very similar things. But essentially in this second case, they're Asking, given a compute budget, how many parameters should we be using? With that explained, we can now go to this first graph where they have the number of parameters of the model graphed against the training line. And this is the compute budget here or the amount of flops used. So you can see that they have for each number of flops because they started with each one of these and then chose different parameters for each of these, right? You can see for each of these, this is one graph where they have six times 10 to the 18 flops. Here is another one where they have, or is this two? I think this is one, it's kind of hard to tell though, where they have 10 to the 19 flops. And as you can see, they just continue this for up to going to whatever this point is right here. And for each of these different curves, what we want to see is which point of these has the minimal training loss. So for the first one of these, this would be the point with the minimal training loss here. It would be this, this one, something like this. I'm, I'm kind of eyeballing it, right? But you can see I'm just looking for the bottom of these curves, or not even the bottom of the curves, but really I'm just looking for the lowest point at each of these. So if we then take each of these, which is essentially the optimal configuration, and when I say configuration, I mean the combination of the number of parameters and the number of training tokens. So when we take each of these optimal configurations for a given number of flops, we can then go to the right and plot these and get this and this. And you can see that they do a linear fit for each of these. So it's essentially given a number of flops, what's the optimal number of parameters? And given a number of flops, what's the optimal number of tokens? These are the same graphs we saw before, except for now they're just using a different method of generating them. And what you see here is they do another linear fit to essentially extrapolate that into the future. One thing I will note here though, is that they do a linear fit, but this doesn't necessarily look like it's a linear relationship for me. For here, it looks almost like uh, like this is kind of tempering off. Maybe it's a bit extreme what I just drew there, but a very slow sort of tempering off. Whereas here, this looks like it's starting to go upwards. Now, I'm not sure if this is actually the case or this is just due to a lack of data. Very clearly, you know, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine points here. Nine points is, is not enough, I'd say, to make a conclusion about that. But I do wonder why they did the linear fit or why they didn't talk about that in this paper as far as I read, because I mean, just looking at this, it doesn't look like it is necessarily linear. Maybe, maybe you guys can let me know in the comments. Maybe there could be some statistical test to test whether or not it should be a linear fit, but regardless, that's not something they do in the paper. One thing you might be wondering is, okay, so this is a second way of estimating these things. How does this match up against the first method, the method we just looked at previously? Uh, and the answer to that is we can actually see that if we go here, so this is the estimate for gopher right here, this turquoise sort of ish line right here. So what they do here is they estimate 
for Gopher, given the number of compute flops we had for Gopher, they estimate it should have been 63 billion parameters trained with 1.4 trillion tokens. Now, if we scroll up, we can see whether or not that matches. And here, what you'll see is they got 67 billion parameters with 1.5 trillion tokens. So these are very similar. Obviously, these might diverge a little bit as your computation budget scales up. So these are quite similar, at least at this point in the fit. As I mentioned, there are three methods. So what we are looking at now are the figures for this final and third method. In the third method, it actually uses the data produced from the past two methods, and it just fits a new model. Now, we could go into the math of how this works, but honestly, I haven't really spent the time to understand it, and I really don't want to. <laughs> so we're just gonna look at the results, and I'll leave that to you if you're really interested in the math of it. But what you'll see on the left is essentially you have this sort of contour plot right here. So on the x-axis, again, it's the amount of compute, and here we have the model size. And if you're not familiar with reading these types of graphs, essentially what this means is if you go to the very left on one of these contours, so say this point right here, and we match this down to the number of flops, this looks like it's, oh gosh, what would that be? let's just say 10 to the 21 flops to simplify this that would mean that for 10 to the 21 flops or plus a little bit the optimal model size would be this right here and while this might be the optimal model size which looks to be roughly 8 billion or so beyond just telling us what the optimal model size is though we can take another example say with this 10 to the 22 amount of flops if we go up here and draw a line. Now that's obviously not too straight, but now if we take one of these contours that this intersects with, say this one, you can see it intersects at two places, one right here and one right here. So these are not optimal, but if we trace these out, we can see that one of these is roughly 1 billion parameters and the other is 40 billion parameters. And essentially what this means is that if we have 10 to the 22 flops, and we train a model with 1 billion parameters, we can expect the same performance as a model that's trained with 40 billion parameters. And while this might be a little bit weird, the reason for this, the reason for this discrepancy is essentially, I, I'm pretty sure that this is assuming the 1 billion parameter model right here would be trained with a lot more tokens than the 40 billion parameter model. But it's a way of essentially giving these sorts of interesting equivalences. So just in case you haven't seen a contour plot before, it's certainly an interesting way to show this. As you move down the gradient of the slope right here, this is sort of like a 2D plot, you get higher and higher losses. So the further you get towards this point, the lower the loss. Uh, so further this way is better, further to the upper right. I've absolutely destroyed this graph at this point. Let me try and <laughs> recover it a little bit. Anyway, uh, that's that. And then what we see on the right here is something we've seen similar before. For different number of train flops, we have these different curves. And then for each of these curves, we can get a minimal point to figure out what the best model size is for each of these number of flops, except for now, we're just using a different method to extrapolate these numbers. Just like before, where you're probably kind of curious how this stacks up against the previous two models. Here, this is the gopher budget. And you can see for the gopher, gopher budget, if we trace this up and then to the left, we end up with 40 billion parameters. Now you might realize that this is a bit less than what we had before. The previous models, I think it was like, they predicted 65 billion parameters would have been optimal. And then like 67 billion parameters here, we're getting 40 billion. So I guess you could say in one sense, what is that? That's over 50% off. Uh, not only is it 50% off, but it's like billions and billions of parameters. That's quite a bit. Uh, but on the other hand, you could also, I think say when we're working with uh, orders of magnitudes of models, maybe this isn't a huge difference. You could say that it's at least somewhat within the same ballpark. So I'm not sure how you want to look at it, but it's probably not too bad, though it does definitely underestimate compared to the last two models, which is interesting, especially considering that this third method, remember it used the data from the two last models. So I guess it just has to do with how the model works. Now that we've talked through and somewhat understood all three of these methods, we can move into the implications of them and eventually go into how they actually build chinchilla and the results they get from that. So if we scroll down, this really kind of all feeds into this idea, especially this table shows it really well, this table three, that modern day models, massive language models that many companies are building are really oversized. Here on the left, you can see the number of parameters. And then here close to the right, you can see the flops interestingly enough in a unit that's essentially how many times more that it should be trained than Gopher. Uh, so that might not make too much sense, but let me go through it and I think it will maybe make a little bit more sense. So here you can see at 67 billion parameters, they expect that they should have used the same computational power they used to train Gopher. Yet Gopher had 280 billion parameters, right? So if we go to the 280 billion parameter mark, they give this number 17.2. What that means is that they're saying if they wanted to be optimal in their use of compute, Gopher should have actually been a 62 billion parameter model, not a 280 billion parameter model. If they wanted to make the 280 billion parameter model, they actually should have used 17.2 times 
the compute that they used compared to when they actually trained it. And then if you want to train something like a 1 trillion parameter model, which many people have sort of been seeking after recently or getting a little excited for, I think, you know, maybe it's just me breaking that 1 trillion parameter threshold. But what this is essentially showing is that maybe that excitement is a bit premature because if you want to train a 1 trillion parameter model, you need uh, 1 times 10 to the 26 flops or two, over 200 times the compute power used in Gopher. And Gopher was already a massive model that used a lot of compute from Google and had a huge budget. So using two over 200 times more compute, well, hardware just in general, and maybe algorithms, it's just not quite there yet. Now, it doesn't mean that someone can't train a 1 trillion parameter model and still get good results. It just means they could have easily trained a smaller model and gotten better results. So there's really no reason to train a 1 trillion parameter model. You'd essentially just be wasting your resources. Down here in the appendix, they actually have a really good example of this if you look at these two graphs. What this essentially shows is the training of two models. One of the models had 2.8 billion parameters, and I, th I think that's the blue model, and the other model had about 4.8 billion parameters. The difference in these two models though is not just the number of parameters, but also the amount of tokens they used. So the yellow line you see here, and also the one you see here, these use the Kaplan et al 2020 approach. And remember that is the approach that essentially they're saying incorrectly predicted how many tokens you should use. So using those numbers, they get the yellow lines here and using their numbers from the approaches we discussed just a little bit ago, they get the blue lines. So first, if we look at the left graph, what you can see is sequences here is just essentially amount of training that they did, like how many tokens I think is what they mean by that. And you can see that the blue model does better, but it's also trained for longer. So their model does better, but it has to be trained on more tokens. And if we cut this off right here, you can see if they were trained on the same number of tokens, well then the yellow model would perform better. And that's why what this paper is talking about, why it might have not have been obvious initially, right? Because it looks just on paper, if you're just looking at the amount of training data, it looks like the bigger model is actually performing better. However, when on the x-axis, we don't look at the number of tokens, but we look at the amount of compute that's used, which is almost always the limiting factor in large models, you can see that with the same amount of compute, this blue model using the numbers from this paper actually performs better. Now, I do want to give a slight disclaimer here. This 2.8 billion parameters and the 4.8 billion parameters, these are the numbers that align very well with the testing they were doing. They were testing models within this range. It is a little bit harder to say if this would work with models outside of this range, but as we'll get into shortly with Chinchilla, it does look like even when you scale up quite a bit more, these numbers still do hold, at least to the extent that they show in this paper. And the last thing I want to talk about before we dive into Chinchilla itself, this new model, is kind of putting this whole thing into context, particularly this number of tokens. We've been talking about essentially the importance of scaling up the amount of training data you're training on, but it's kind of hard to get an idea of like, what is 8 billion tokens? Like how much text is that for a human to read? Or what is 1.5 trillion tokens? Like how much is that? So to put this into context, I did a quick just Google search and came up with the fact that the average novel has very roughly about 100,000 words. Now let's be generous because we need to tokenize this, which means that 100,000 words might become something like 200,000 tokens. So if we take this estimate of 200,000 tokens per like your average novel, and then we take this 1.5 trillion number, which is how much data they're saying should have been used to train Gopher, we can do 1.5 trillion quite simply divided by 200k. And this will be essentially how many roughly novels. And obviously this is trained on not just novels, but like web text and all this sort of stuff. But if we were to train on novels, you would need roughly 75 million novels to train on. That's a whole lot of data. And I like to put this into context because we can do this much when we look at the web. The web has a lot of data, massive amounts of data on it. Um, but once we start getting to numbers like 2.16 trillion, that's a lot of data. I'm sure we can still find that much data on the web. Like it's always constantly growing and there is just massive amounts of text on the internet. But I think having high quality data is also important. So maybe that can be solved by some sort of like computer-based filtering. You know, obviously you can't have a human look over all this data alone, but it is something to start thinking about. Like this really is a massive, massive amount of data just to store. Finally, I want to move on to Chinchilla itself. This research team trained 400 models to figure out what we've been talking about. And now Chinchilla is essentially the way they're putting this into action and showing that this actually does work for these massive language models that people are building. The idea of Chinchilla was essentially to take those numbers and redo Gopher in a sense, not entirely, but redoing it with the numbers that they've calculated, which are between roughly 40 and 70 billion parameters. So they took the upper end of that. They said, let's train a model with 70 billion parameters and 1.4 trillion tokens, but use the exact same 
same amount of computation as Gopher. And this is a very key thing. Even though, as we'll see, Chinchilla ends up outperforming Gopher with a smaller number of parameters, it still does use the same compute for training, which means it's not any less computationally expensive to train. Matter of fact, it also does take more data. It would, at the very least, though, be less expensive to use during inference time, which is after training. If they want to use the model, it's smaller now. So at that point, there is a benefit to the model itself being smaller. In terms of the model and training details that they go over right here, you really don't need to go over this. It's it's basically the same stuff. They use the same thing as in Gopher. If you haven't seen my Gopher paper, I do have one, by the way, but I'll very quickly go over it. Essentially, they train on this massive text data set. It's just a bunch of data from online, things like Wikipedia and web pages and GitHub, all this sort of stuff. They do also change the optimizer very slightly. And then they also modify the way they do tokenization a little bit. It's nothing too major, I think. I mean, I'm not an expert when it comes to these things, but they seem to be relatively minor changes. Other than that, the architecture, it's still the same type of transformer, just scaled down a bit. How does it do though? That is the question. Here you can see these are all the different tasks they trained on. So each of these is a different type of task, right? So like common sense is a type of task. And then within that, I guess, category, they have like five different tasks, MMLU, and Big Bench being the two biggest of those. And one thing they do mention that I think is important is because they are using more data for training, there is also the chance of unfortunately having more data leakage. They say that they do their best to look out for it, but it should be acknowledged in it could possibly one of the reasons that Chinchilla does perform a bit better. With that in mind though, let's take a look at the results. And down here, you can see an overview of all the results. So here you have random randoms at 25%, I think because these are probably multiple choice questions. Then you can see the average human rater did not do very well. But then again, these humans probably aren't trained in these specific tasks they're doing. You can see the GPT-3 and the Gopher performances. And then you can see Chinchilla coming seven percentage points above Gopher. That's still a ways below human experts. So keep that in mind. But clearly there is a significant performance improvement when compared to previous methods. And this is five shot learning which essentially means that the model will get five examples of the problem it's trying to solve, and then it's given all the testing examples, you know, instead of being fine-tuned on that specific task beforehand. Now, this is just on the MMLU data set, but we can also see a further breakdown of this because the MMLU data set contains 57 tasks alone. So you can see a breakdown of how it performed in each category if we look at this graph down here. Let me zoom in a little bit to make this easier to see. And here it shows the percentage improvement over Go. So this is not the absolute performance, performance, but rather relative to the next best method. And what you'll see is that, well, it does quite a bit better on almost everything. It doesn't do better on a few things. As a matter of fact, it gets worse on something. And this is one thing I want to talk about. What does it get worse on? It gets worse at college mathematics, eco econometrics, econometrics. I don't know what that is, but I have a feeling it has to do with the economy, moral scenarios, and formal logic. So what you might notice is that two of these have to do with math. And one of the things I mentioned in my previous video is that these large language models seem to be very good in scaling up does seem to have a huge impact. But these exact same results we're seeing in Gopher where some of these higher level mathematics courses, well, the performance actually gets worse, or maybe even if it doesn't get worse, it doesn't improve that much. And perhaps that's because maybe these models are really good at solving problems that they've seen that are similar to others, but maybe not as good at generalizing to completely new ideas or really thinking through math problems, right? Like, I guess I'm kind of just using buzzwords at this point, but it seems like even if we scale these models, maybe there's still something that's missing when it comes to these high levels of math and logic. Now, it did perform better on like college physics, for example, which I think is surprising. So you might ask, you know, there's lots of math and physics. Why might that be? There's also high school mathematics and there's there's some other things. Yeah, there's high school chemistry. I think there's high school statistics in here. So these are clearly difficult things. Why would it do better in these? And, you know, I don't have a conclusive answer. I would really have to look through these data sets one by one if I wanted to understand understand them, uh, but I don't have the time for that. And that's why my guess is kind of that these things over here, maybe it's much more common to find like similar problems or maybe there's some sort of data leakage, or maybe it's just that uh, there's something that's different about college level mathematics that requires you to have some sort of deeper level understanding or take more steps to do your work. I'm not entirely sure, but I did just want to point it out. And also, unfortunately, there was no improvement in machine learning. So sorry, no AGI anytime soon by scaling up these models. <laughs>
If we scroll down a little bit more, we can also see the performance on the big bench, which is very similar to MMLU in the sense that it's a big collection of many different tasks. And we essentially see the same thing. It does much better on many different tasks. However, if we look at the ones it doesn't do well on, there is like mathematical induction is still here and, and logical arguments. So very similar. So I do think that this might be some sort of pattern. I really couldn't tell you. Again, someone would need to do more research into this. And I am very curious if anyone has, please link it in the description. I, I want to read. It. There are also things like dark humor detection, which I thought was kind of funny. I wonder why these are so bad at dark humor detection. Maybe it's because the way to pick up on humor is often changing and very subtle, but all around interesting results. And essentially all around beyond just MMLU and Big Bench, performance was up on essentially all the tasks that Chinchilla was tested on. So this also includes reading comprehension. There's also like common sense reasoning. Then there was closed book question answering, gender bias and toxicity. And essentially everything was tested on, there were improvements. Now going down to the conclusion and just giving you a recap of this. Essentially, these researchers trained a bunch of models, found that model and scaling is very important, but just as important as scaling the amount of data. They came up with an optimal way of scaling those, trained chinchilla using those numbers, and produced a new state-of-the-art model in many areas of NLP. Given that summary, I want to talk about my thoughts and critiques of this paper if you're interested. Now, I should start off by saying that I think this paper is really great. I think this will be a great resource for companies building these large models, you know, like the three or four companies that build these models, <laughs> um, but it will help them train these more efficiently, which hopefully will lead to faster progress in the field. However, one of my complaints, my first complaint, and this isn't so much as a complaint as it is a question because I'm not super well educated in this area, is whether or not flops is a good way to measure this. And the reason I say that is because I think flops is somewhat intertwined with sort of the architectures of these models and the hardware they run on. I'm not 100% sure on that. Don't take my word on it. It's more of a question as to whether or not that would affect it. And if it does, are these numbers we'll still be able to use 20 years from now, even if things are like hardware are changing a lot? I don't know. It'd be something I'd be interested to hear about from someone that knows more about that. The other thing I want to bring up brings us back to the second method they use, and it has to do with these linear fits. I mean, I was just staring at these forever when I was making this video, and this, this line I draw here clearly is not good. But if you look at this, these just don't look linear to me. And it could be because there's not enough data points here, and I could understand why they can't get more data points. This already took so much computation to generate. I just have some hesitation. I have some hesitation believing this. Maybe future work will make me more confident in these results. But as of now, I wish they would have at least discussed why they decided to go with linear fits instead of what looks to me like, you know, a nonlinear fit. And the third thing I want to mention is this third method. It does kind of bother me that it used the data from the first two methods, yet still ended up with a 50% undershoot of what the other ones predicted. When we scale all the way down to the appendix over here, what we can see is the scaling with approaches two and approach three. And although the predictions were only roughly 50% off around this range, the further we go, and this looks, you can see this even more clearly in this graph, you can see that the more we scale up, the larger this gap will become. Essentially meaning that the further we get into the future and the larger our models get and the more data we'll start to be using, well, it'll be more important to figure out which one of these models is right. I mean, at the end of the day, I think both of them are still probably a lot better than what we had before. So it's an improvement regardless. Uh, but I do wonder why they came up with such numbers. I guess the real reason is just maybe the reason just boils down to there's just a limit to how much data they can calculate. And within the limits of that amount of data, this is the best they can do. I'm really not sure. But other than that, I'm really happy this paper came out. And I thought it was very interesting to read. And I encourage you to read it yourself if you found this interesting. Anyway, the last thing I want to say is if you enjoy this, consider subscribing. It really means a lot and it helps out the channel. I really do appreciate it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you next time.